This is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. And I'm excited today to be talking with Dr. David Moen, a family physician who I've known uh, for a number of years, uh, originally came to our Innovators Network some years ago, who's doing some fascinating work that he'll talk about today. He's president of uh, professional corporations in over 30 states. And those uh, corporations, um, through their services, they are providing advanced care uh, delivery for high-risk populations. And uh, he tells me this morning that there's somewhere on the high side of 450 clinicians active through the, the uh, various companies that he works with. They very, uh, thank you very much for joining with us this morning. Thank you, Larry. It's great to see you. And I look forward to sharing uh, some of what I've learned and how I got to where I am with our listeners. Cool. So a little background. Uh, tell me about uh, your general background growing up, your family, where did you grow up? What kind of uh, uh, an environment uh, did you grow up in? So I was born in a town of about 900 people and my dad was the family doctor for that town. And so uh, our house phone was the answering service. And uh, I was the sixth kid. My mom was hoping it was menopause, but she was 45 and it was me. And uh, my dad was in his late 40s. So they were mature parents, um, lots of siblings to learn from. And by age 10, I was quite adept at triaging phone calls. Uh, and in fact, my dad uh, assigned me to be the listener for one of his uh, patients with hypochondriasis who called every night at every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. And I became adept at listening. And when I asked my dad for guidance, he said, well, what she needs is a set of ears and you have two, so. I think you're qualified. And uh, that was the direction I got. And I listened to Mrs. Olson, we'll call her, for uh, many nights. And my older siblings were happy that I had been advanced into the that role. They were ready to hand that off. Learned a lot from Mrs. Olson about the fears people have and the value of empathetic listening. Uh, I actually didn't need to know a thing about medicine to understand that what she needed was to be heard. And it was powerful. And every once in a while, I would say, I'll be sure to tell my dad that. And that gave her reassurance. She had a lot of faith and trust in my dad. And uh, he built relationships with people uh, very effectively. And he told me that 60 to 70% of what he did for patients uh, resided between their ears. And he said that uh, the psychological impact of uh, you know, what people experience in life causes all sorts of ramifications and good doctors understand that they're there to understand that and support people in uh, moving forward uh, in whatever way made sense to them and providing them guidance and support. I, uh, it was daunting to go to med, med school. None of my siblings chose to follow my dad. Uh, I think there were very big footsteps when you're a kid in a town of 900 and your dad's the doctor. Uh, and my dad had a, a big physical presence and was just a, an amazing uh, physician. And uh, I went to college thinking that I would go into finance like my brothers all had done. And I spent uh, the first semester hating accounting and having to stay at pull an all nighter before the final to pass the accounting class. And I found biology to be an absolute breeze because I was so interested in, in biology. And by the second semester, it became clear that I was not headed to finance and I was going to go into the sciences. And I took um, all the pre-medical requirements and ended up getting into several medical schools. I was fortunate, um, University of Chicago, um, University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin. And I chose to go to University of Wisconsin-Madison because it was the cheapest and I was newly married and had no money. So. It ended up being a wonderful institution. Uh, I was in the 80s and there was a, 
real emphasis at Wisconsin on the whole person at that stage. And what I found in my clinical rotations is it was hard for me to narrow down and address one piece of a person. I also found the personalities in some of the specialties were off-putting to me. Anesthesiologists tend to talk about their boats uh, and their cars and in the doctor's lounge, and they like to sip coffee a lot. And, and I just found it to be so different than what I grew up with, uh, some of the subspecialty subspecial, work. And uh, I chose to go into family medicine, which the dean called me and said, that's, that's just a mistake, Dave. You're one of our top students. And uh, you should be going into academic medicine. And um, I just uh, couldn't let go of what I had experienced growing up. And I chose to go to the University of Minnesota, which had a very strong family medicine program uh, in the late 80s. And uh, I ended up there with amazing uh, people from Yale and uh, you know, all over the, the United States that were passionate about family medicine. So it was a tremendous residency program. And the thing that distinguished it for me um, was that they had an emergency medicine track and a family medicine track, um, and they weren't formally called that. However, there was just so much hands-on experience covering the emergency department of a large Catholic hospital in downtown Minneapolis that served a very urban, dense neighborhood, diverse. Um, that it was a wonderful place to train. I spent my first OB rotation caring for women that had no insurance who were pregnant. Uh, we had a clinic that was free for people with no insurance and I became acquainted with uh, how underserved portions of the population actually are. And I uh, got a tremendous exposure to really the social determinants of health and how they impacted these women and their pregnancies. And uh, so I got a just a great training there. It became clear to me though that the clinic model, the sort of 15 to 30 vi minute visit model just didn't really work for me. I found that um, I was good at it. However, I felt like I was frequently not addressing what the patient was there uh, to really address and, and the time pressures were real and the pace of all that was picking up as uh, that was when HMOs were starting to come into the Twin Cities. And so my residency was, I was seeing physicians getting very uh, burned out, frustrated with the clinic. And I gravitated to the emergency department because uh, there was such freedom to just see patients and see lots of patients and spend the amount of time required uh, to solve the problem because people came with an expectation that they were probably going to have to wait. So they didn't have this appointment mentality. And so I could spend 45 minutes with a 14 year old and her mom and dad who had, you know, cut her wrist, you know, 47 times with a needle, which we all know is not a suicide attempt, it's a cry for help. Um, and get the parents comfortable taking uh, their daughter home, which is, you know, not what they wanted when they walked in, but that takes time to help de-escalate the fear associated with that. And I just found a lot of success in that environment. I could reduce a dislocated shoulder in the waiting room before the person even registered by just looking them in the eye and talking quietly and slowly doing a maneuver and the shoulder was in. And we were paid, you know, $1,500 for that. And I was paid $67 for the 45 minutes I spent, uh, you know, with the family, uh, with the 14 year old with a suicide gesture. And uh, what in the emergency department, it all worked out that I could have a life, I could make enough money to support a family, which I was started, started my own family um, at that time. And I liked the, the distinction between work and home that the emergency medicine op, uh, world offered. I grew up where medicine was in our living room 24 seven. I saw some of the downside of that. And so in my own family, I appreciate, appreciated the solid line between the emergency department and my home. Uh, so there's a clear distinction there that my wife also found helpful. 
uh, as I chose my career. I can imagine. Yeah, so I ended up uh, working in emergency medicine for 20 years. And interestingly, I had an opportunity to build an emergency services division, which became a huge division across two hospitals. Um, in after seven years of practice in urban Minneapolis at the institution I trained at, I, I joined that group as an emergency physician and then uh, left to uh, start a, an emergency medicine group <clears throat> in a region of Minnesota that was merging three hospitals covering 2,000 square miles. And one of the hospitals was the same size as the one in my small town. And uh, we were closing that hospital because of consolidation required to support, you know, hospital type services uh, at this time of the healthcare, you know, transformation that was happening. And uh, so I, I built this emergency medical group at um, uh, Fairview Lakes Regional Medical Center, which is just northeast of the Twin Cities. And interestingly, we had 25 physicians and 23 were trained in family medicine and two were trained in emergency medicine. And then we also engaged the local family medicine groups that admitted patients to the hospital. Uh, they had been covering these emergency departments at these small hospitals. Many of them wanted to continue to do emergency medicine. So we built a program where they could be what I would call a level one physician who did all the training and things like rapid sequence intubation and putting in chest tubes and all the things that we needed our emergency physicians to be good at. We had a lab where we trained people and they had to go through this training every couple of years to ensure that the procedural part of their skills stayed up to speed. And uh, we ended up growing this group in partnership with the clinics in the community. And that was greatly appreciated by those family physicians who wanted to still do some emergency medicine. We also had a track where if they didn't want to do all the training, they could double staff with one of us that was called a level one physician. And then we had level three physicians who would do some urgent care. And then when they were on call, they were willing to be called in and paid additional to help us deal with surges in the emergency department. So we built quite a system over the next 13 years. That hospital grew dramatically. The projection for our growth was to reach a certain number. And we actually reached three X of that in our emergency services division. Uh, we built an urgent care next to the emergency department so that people wouldn't be overcharged for coming in with a sore ear. They could pop into our urgent care and see one of our nurse practitioners or physician assistants. We also built a phone triage line. So when people called our emergency department, we just didn't say we don't give medical advice and hang up. We actually had a nurse that would go through and, and talk to these people. And 60% of those people stayed home, 20%. Uh, took appointments in our clinic, which we could do uh, for them within 48 hours. And 20% came in to see either in our urgent care or our emergency department. So we built this really slick system and a new CEO came in and saw what we'd done. It was the most profitable emergency department in this big health system uh, in the Twin Cities. And he asked if I would want to lead innovation for the health system. And by that time, I had been practicing for 20 years and was really getting acquainted with the gaps in the American health system, uh, personally acquainted with the patients that come to the emergency department. 80% of those patients aren't emergencies. Uh, they're falling through some sort of gap in our system. And became acquainted with, you know, the problem of frail elders, uh, problem of people with chronic disease, uh, pain, and got very interested in what might different models of care look like. And it just happened that the CEO was very visionary and he'd asked if I'd lead teams to solve for uh, some of the issues facing the health system. And so I was given a $10 million budget and uh, led teams that uh, put medical homes in our uh, 40 some clinics and our primary care practices. And we built specific models for people with depression and diabetes 
and orthopedic pain uh, and got subject matter experts, physicians, nurses together to really understand how we saw the population through the lens of data and then build actual models that met those needs and then tested those models over time. And so that part of my career really equipped me for what I do today. I eventually became CEO of a physician network in Minneapolis, Fairview Physician Associates. We became an ACO. Uh, we signed shared savings contracts. We did all the things that you heard about five years ago. After two years of that, I could see that uh, the hospitals were dominating the conversations in the, that organization. The physicians in the clinic, especially primary care, were highly disenfranchised. And I just wasn't able to change that given the dynamics and the finance models. You know, all these great models we were building were reducing hospitalization and ED visits and use of expensive radiology services and surgery. And I don't know if you've heard the old statement, uh, people have a hard time understanding what makes their income go down. Um, nobody could really understand why we were doing this. So uh, it became clear to me after a couple of years, I spent five years in that whole track of innovation and being CEO of this network, it became clear that the hospitals were completely dominating the financial picture and they were in conversation with the health plans and the meetings after the meetings and physicians were gonna be left out. So I left um, in 2012. And interestingly, United Health Group is based here. And they had just uh, put a large amount of money into a venture fund and had been watching some of what I was doing in our community. And they were very interested in having me be an advisor to this venture fund. And I was really skeptical. In fact, I said to their CEO at the time, uh, you know, I've always viewed United Health Group as the dust star on the west side of the city. Uh, and he laughed and said, you have a reputation for being direct. And I said, <laughs> yeah, I do. So I ended up uh, and have ended up now for the last almost 10 years helping United Health Group as an insurer use their data and information and their money to invest in building care delivery models, companies that actually provide care, not care management, not health plan people bugging you about utilization management, not prior authorization. None of those things work in my opinion, but actually doing what I was doing uh, in my innovation role is identifying high-risk populations that don't get served in the regular care delivery model and then uh, purpose building companies that um, address the needs of those patients in a new and different way. And the things that we often leverage in order to do that, they're similar across all these models. One, teams are essential. Physicians can't do this by themselves. Um, you know, my dad's ability to be a more holistic physician was in part enabled by the less complexity of medicine in the 1960s and 70s compared to today. It is, you know, it's much more complex. The expectations of patients were different back then. And um, as a physician, by myself, I've found it's just really difficult to do this lift by myself. And I found it much more effective to build teams. And often they include social workers, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, people with analytics background and business background to actually build these models and these companies. So over the last decade, I've been able to work on nine different companies. I'm currently supporting three. Uh, and as Larry said in the intro, there's over 450 clinicians in over 25 states that are employed on the professional corporation model that I've built in partnership with United. So what we've figured out is what are the key governance um, uh, issues that maintain the clinical integrity of a company? And what I've found is that it's important for clinicians to control what we measure for quality, what we measure for productivity, 
how we pay people and uh, how we credential, who we credential and hire and how we train them, what we train them to do. So uh, in the professional corporation management services model where the professional corporation is employing all the clinicians, the management companies helping manage the practice, the professional corporation that employs all the clinicians actually makes the governance decisions about things like productivity, uh, quality, compensation, hiring, and training. So you can build a, a medical group, a clinical group, you can build to your specifications to meet the needs of the population. And then the business has to figure out how to support that. And it felt to me like that had got flipped in my world of working for a large integrated delivery system dominated by hospitals. It felt like we as physicians were uh, being whipped around by a much bigger animal. And uh, this model provides an appropriate balance, I think, between uh, clinical uh, issues associated with serving people and, and the business issues. They're both important, but uh, we've got to get that in the balance right. So the governance model of these professional corporations really addresses that. And interesting, many states like New York, like California, really care about this. <laughs> and they have very strict laws about corporate practice of medicine. And so who owns a practice, who governs a practice matters in many states. They take the corporate practice of medicine doctrine from the AMA very seriously. Some states like Minnesota don't care. They've just turned it over to nonprofit hospitals and health plans and said, you figure it out. States like New York require the professional corporation to be owned by a licensed physician, licensed in that state. So, um, you know, different states take it seriously. What we've learned uh, in building these companies is it meets the regulatory mark and almost more importantly, in my mind, it provides an appropriate division of power that allows us to really build highly effective companies that maintain the appropriate balance between business and clinical. So I'll pause there. That's a lot to swallow, Larry. It is. You have, over the years, uh, really helped me uh, appreciate the corporate practice of medicine laws and the need for physician governance. Um, as somebody who was a hospital administrator for a small part of my career, I got the behind the scenes and how the administrators thought about the docs. Yep. And uh, mostly uh, you intimidated them. Right. Quite honestly, they would never mention that in public. But uh, so for you to, and, and that intimidation means that they, they would make decisions that weren't always in the best interest of, of the people uh, that the system was serving. And they certainly weren't in the best interest of the docs. And it was contentious. And it was just a waste of energy. Um, and But they had a hard time uh, admitting that the physicians were call it smarter or understand clinical care and health outcomes better than, than they did. So you've really supported my uh, appreciation for the, the value of that. So let's jump forward a little bit here, Dave. Talk about uh, the kind of focus for these uh, uh, companies uh, that you're running now that are providing advanced care delivery for high-risk populations. Yeah, so Prospero is the largest, has over 600 employees, and we're in 26 states. It's Prospero, just like it sounds. Um, and what we do is identify through claims data people with two chronic conditions who've experienced a hospitalization or are showing other high risk criteria indicating that they're approaching frail. Uh, frail time of life. They're in their final chapter. Uh, 20 to 30% of our patients at Prospero die within 12 months. What we've found in the data is that one, those people spend tons of money. And what I know as from being a clinician is it's often wasted. Um, what we're really not doing is getting real with people about what their prognosis is and getting real with people about what kind of support they require and really trying to understand what their goals are. Um, and uh, our patients want curative treatment. 
they want to stay with their doctors. Uh, their doctors are overwhelmed. These are the patients that have a hard time getting from the waiting room to the exam room in the time it takes that it's slotted for an appointment. <laughs> These are people that are very challenging. And what I could see when I was working in emergency medicine, I saw these people all the time. If they get to the ER, they get admitted whether they need it or not um, because uh, they, they aren't doing well at home. Uh, and it's very challenging as a physician in a clinic to get your head around that. So what, what you do is meet these people in their home have a nurse practitioner spend about an hour and a half doing a comprehensive assessment of uh, their health and the social determinants of health. And then we come back as a team, a physician, nurse practitioner, nurses, and social workers, and talk about the patients and decide what sort of cadence of care delivery makes sense for that patient. What are the key things we need to address? How do we align the family around what the patients begun to articulate as their goals? And then which member of the team is really best suited uh, to be the lead contact person? Sometimes it's an RN, sometimes it's an NP. And sometimes the physician comes in as a, an assist, for instance, to talk to a daughter who doesn't believe in nurse practitioners or to uh, talk to an oncologist who won't answer the phone unless it's another doctor. Um, and we have the hard conversations with family members and other physicians about prognosis and reality of what actually the patient wants and try to advocate for the patient's uh, wishes. Uh, what we've found with this model, uh, it's been going since June of 2019, is that uh, we're reducing admissions to the hospital by 40%. Uh, we are, uh, increasing days at home in the last year of life by 59%. So that includes admission reductions, but also you know, days spent in TCUs and other places that these populations end up not wanting to be there. And we also have increased the hospice utilization by 30% and the length of stay in the hospice by 2.7x. Um, so people are, more people are in hospice and more people are there for longer days. And I mean, we all know that more people should use hospice. And in the US, we're in hospice on an average of maybe 10 to 14 days, depending on what state you're in. And we all know it should be bigger, longer than that uh, for people that are dying. So we've had great success and that, that company's growing fast. The other company I work with uh, focuses on hands-on treatment for people with musculoskeletal conditions. That company's called Orthology. It's in Minnesota and New York. And it, we have uh, chiropractors, physical therapists, and physiatrists uh, who work with patients, massage therapists as well. And what we know is that type of approach done really well um, reduces cost, reduces surgeries, re reduces imaging, um, reduces narcotics. Uh, you, the trick here is you have to do it really well. So I'm not a fan of just any chiropractor or just any physical therapist. Uh, I think what we do is focus on people who really understand manual treatment, understand trigger point release, understand joint mobilization, understand things that take additional training than many people in the field have that, that work in this part of care delivery. So that company has been successful and uh, is doing great work. And, um, and then I work with a company called Level 2, which is new. I just started helping that company at the end of December or beginning of December, I guess. Um, and we are focused on people with type 2 diabetes. And what we can see in the health claims data is many people with type 2 diabetes are cared for in a practice that has four or five people with type 2 diabetes. And given all the changes that have occurred in the management of people with type 2 diabetes, there's just tons of variability in, in what people are actually getting in terms of care delivery. We see bad drug combinations. We see no lifestyle counseling. We see no access to diabetes education. Uh, we see lack of access to endocrinologists. Um, 
And so it's been interesting that that population is uh, growing dramatically. And what we've found is by combining physician, nurse education, health coaching, um, and uh, really better medication management, uh, we can often uh, get people motivated to lose weight, to uh, change their medication regimens, to try fasting uh, in patients that it's safe, uh, to do some more advanced lifestyle interventions that are informed by today's science about weight loss, which isn't calories in, calories out anymore. The, the science around weight loss has changed, but it, the practice of weight loss has not changed. So we're really working on getting the best science, the best coaching, the best motivational interviewing in the hands of people. And what we see is done well, many people change. We also give patients a free uh, continuous glucose monitor uh, if they enroll with our practice. And uh, we use that information uh, so that the patient can actually see for themselves how their eating patterns are influencing their blood sugar. So if you notice with those three companies, my focus is complex patients, sometimes multifactorial complex like Prospero, sometimes it's chronic conditions like type level two. Those are the people that just aren't served with our acute care system that we've built. Uh, it's people with chronic conditions and complex conditions. So that's where my focus is today. So Dave, how does the, with these three companies, how do they relate to the patient's primary care physicians? In every single one we co-manage, um, especially primary care docs and, and sometimes specialists, patients want to maintain that relationship. They really value, especially ones that have had a relationship over time, they tremendously value that and so do we. So we meet with our larger physician groups that we work with and just say, how would you like to be involved? Um, really great physicians know these patients aren't being served and they're not threatened by uh, a company that can come in and help as long as we honor what they've built with the patient. And it's, it's very apparent if you look at national surveys of uh, patients, for instance, with hospice and palliative care, they value very much the relationships with their doctors. Um, and so we honor that. We call it co-management. Um, and so we work with those physicians uh, and really tailor how we work with them to what they want. Some docs want to know of every medication change. Some docs want to make the medication change. Um, some docs don't want to know about anything other than a quarterly update uh, that they've said, gosh, I'm just swamped and I'd love if you'd take Edna off my hands. <laughs> and, and yes, I'll be socially involved and see her once or twice a year just to maintain my relationship, but I'd really prefer you to take really work with her and her family at this stage. So we are there to support uh, the PCP relationship and the specialty relationship because it matters to the patient. So I have to tell you, uh, I mean, this is just really impressive. Um, the the kind of innovation, um, a broad focus, depth of thinking uh, in, in medical science as well, all combined. Um, it, it's just uh, uh, really exciting to know that uh, that you're out there. And it's being led by somebody with the vision that uh, that you bring to this work. Well, thank you, Larry. You know, I wouldn't be here without the amazing start I had in family medicine with that more holistic view of the world. So many times in my career, people said, Dave, you really, isn't it too bad that you didn't train in emergency medicine? Your career would be, you'd just be able to do anything in emergency medicine. And and it's been interesting as I've matured through my career, my training in family medicine has been the cornerstone of my success. Uh, the fact that I can learn on my feet, the fact that I value holistic uh, interactions and understandings of people, uh, the fact that I understand I don't have all the answers and I don't need to have all the answers to feel good about myself. I don't need to be the one with the answer. 
in fact, uh, it goes better when we create an environment that people feel comfortable sharing their expertise. Uh, and so I've learned to appreciate all the skills required in this complex system to drive innovation, which includes data science and knowledge of payment and MBAs and nurses and social workers and nurse practitioners and physicians and specialists and primary care docs. I mean, it, I've just learned how to be better at creating an environment that's safe and comfortable for people to share what it is they believe in and want to want to support and um and i've gotten very comfortable not having to be the one with the answer and yet really having a clear understanding of what's valuable um, trust is the most valuable asset that we have with our patients and uh, everything we do has got to be built on trust and i've also learned to value the well-being of of the workforce it's hard to build trust if you don't have your own well-being in shape and so we over the years and i could share a whole bunch of experiences about how i've learned to do that but i've just really understand that patient satisfaction and trust are actually an output of a clinician's well-being um, and as I got more mature in my career, I've really understood that these companies have to focus on the well-being of the people that work for them um, as, a, as an asset that we need to take care of. And, and it's the most important asset uh, that we have. And so many systems don't understand that. They think patient satisfaction means you need to redecorate the waiting room. Um, and, you know, that's a short term fix, but if you really want to get after patient satisfaction, keep your physicians well. I love the way you've, um, you've brought this all together. Dave, thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing all of this. And uh, uh, it, it is great that you're, you're, you're doing this kind of work. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate, appreciate your leadership in elevating these conversations in the community. Thanks for doing that.